we picked this topic because we, we thought it would be something you could take home to provide better care and to make more money, quite frankly. Uh, some of this other stuff was regulation stuff and compliance stuff and no fun. Now this can be fun, right? One of the most common questions we get is, how can I make more money? And the suggestion that I give may be counterintuitive to some, and that is to slow down and get off the treadmill that too many of us are on of trying to see as many people as you possibly can and bragging, I saw 50 people today, and go the other way and slow only, down. Only 50? And see, not me, and see fewer people and spend more time with those patients. And doing so can help you provide better care, have more satisfied patients, better manage your risk, especially with this one, and have a higher per visit value. If you are not evaluating and obsessing on your per visit value, you should be. The amount that is collected out of that visit and the lesson that it took me a long time to accept is you are better off spending 10 more minutes in the room you're already in than you are running out of that room to get next door and start all over again and spend 15 minutes in there. You're better off slowing down, staying in the room you're in, spend 10 more minutes in there than rushing and cutting their toenails and running out the door so that you can start over next door. So you may say, well, what do I do for those 10 minutes? And what I suggest is a lower extremity skin inspection and look for stuff. And I steal this line from my good friend, Dr. Jonathan Moore, who says, how many of you take the time to roll up your patient's pant legs? There's tons of pathology there, tons. There's stuff to ask about in E&M. There's lots of stuff to biopsy. And if you find something, you're going to be providing better care, have a more satisfied patient. You can E&M it. You can E&M it and biopsy it. You can E&M it and bring them back next week to biopsy it. And this can be a tremendous addition to your practice. We finally hired an associate last year which allowed me to put this into practice. And I have really enjoyed slowing down, finding stuff, and every once in a while, you could save somebody's life. Every once in a while. Most of the stuff we biopsy comes back fine. Every once in a while, you get a bad one. And you say, if I had blown through this visit and cut their toenails and run next door and not looked at their legs, that melanoma could have been cooking. And this is a huge risk thing. This is a uh, high up on the list of podiatrists getting sued is failure to recognize a bad skin thing. You're documenting that you did a skin inspection every 61 days and the dermatologist found a melanoma on the back of their ankle that you never looked at because they were sitting in the chair like this. So this is a nice ad. So we wanted to go through, if I've sold you on this and you want to put this into practice, we wanted to go through uh, the coding of this if you choose to perform these. If you do a punch, right, this takes like 10 seconds. If you have good help in the office and you could say punch biopsy in room two and somebody gets it all lined up for you, you can do Lido with Epi, two millimeter punch, doesn't even need a stitch, in the formalin bottle, Band-Aid and you're out. That's a punch biopsy, that's a 11100. 11100 is a punch biopsy. If you do more than one punch, some people choose to do one from the center, one from the periphery, or one from the center and one that involves good and bad, however you're trained, whatever your preference is. If you do more than one, even if it's in the same thing, the same growth, if you do two punches, there's an add-on code for the additional ones. An add-on code, by definition, does not take a 59 or 51 modifier. Add-on code does not take a 59 or 51, and the 11001 is for each additional. So in this example, if you do three, you do the 11100 for the first one, and then the 11101 for each additional. 
So I'll wait for my pathology report to come back before I put a diagnosis on it. <clears throat> so what diagnosis code do you attach to this? There's two ways you can go. What I suggest, and you might not like it, and I'm going to give you a way to do it either way, what I suggest is you wait until the pathology report comes back, because now you know what it is, and you can attach the appropriate diagnosis to it. None of these codes are complete. They all have dashes next to them, which means they need more characters to complete the code. I didn't want to fill up the slide and your handouts with lefts and rights and unspecifieds. More characters are complete, necessary to complete the code. I don't want you to think these are complete. I think we handled that with the red and the caps and the bold to make sure you don't miss that. So if it comes back as something benign, you can choose from this. If it comes back as something malignant, you can choose from this. It, we're going faster now. You got the list. Kaposi sarcoma, for some reason, has its own. You could use that. If you don't like this idea, if it drives you crazy to not drop your claim the day the visit happens, you can choose this code, which is for a growth that you don't know what it is. You want to talk about the unspecified word in there? That's, that's actually the code that I use most frequently because our hospital, uh, I'm a hospital employee, and they want the bills dropped that day, the day of service. So we actually can't wait for the PATH report to bill it. So if you don't know what it is and you don't want to wait, this is the diagnosis code that should be pointing to your biopsy code. Doctor. Doctor mentioned ENFD, uh, which is a uh, uh, nerve fiber density analysis. What's the E? Epidermal. Epidermal nerve fiber density analysis. Yeah, it's a punch. So. If you're doing that, somebody has neuropathy, you want to do an ENFD to send off that epidermal nerve, it's a punch. It's the same 11100. You can wait and see what it says. I attach a diagnosis of neuropathy, G60 point, it depends on the type of neuropathy. So the G60.0, G60.3, and G60.8. I think one of those is hereditary, one of them is idiopathic, and one of them's other, and I'll have to memorize which is which. So I attach neuropathy for the ENFD. Have any trouble with that being denied with a neuropathy code and a scan procedure? I haven't. Do others? I don't know. Oh. Just ask. No, I'm getting paid. <laughs> oh, that's a half hour answer. Doctor asks, can you do an ENM with the biopsy? The short answer is yes, if that ENM was separately identifiable. So, for example, if it is their first time ever in your office and they come in complaining of burning in their feet at nighttime and you take a history, perform an exam, document your assessment and your plan, if the plan says P colon ENFD performed, there's no ENM there. If the plan says, discuss the above findings with the patient, explain to them that differential diagnoses include A, B, and C. Of these, I think neurop uh, small fiber neuro neuropathy is most likely. We discuss treatment options. We discuss the potential advantages and disadvantages of these treatment options. After this discussion, decision was made for ENFD. I explained what would be involved with this procedure. Paragraph. I suggest, you don't have to, paragraph a couple sentences describing your ENFD, that's a separately identifiable ENM. If you see them today and do that whole workup and schedule them for an ENFD next week and they come in next week and they say, I'm here for that thing you talked about, you say, okay, good, I'm going to do it, no ENM, just the procedure. Continuing with this biopsy discussion, you want to do this or you want me to do it? I'll do this one. Uh, <laughs> there were numerous labs in the, in the country back in the early 2000s that were promoting, uh, if you're sending a piece of nail to their lab for pathological analysis to see whether it's a fungus or whatever, uh, that you should build a nail biopsy 
to and the collection of the nail. Well, what a nail biopsy is, is you numb up the toe. If you're neuropathic, you don't have to, but it includes numbing up the toe, going through the nail plate into the sub subungual tissue and taking a piece of all of that, of the nail unit, which includes the nail and the subungual tissue. That's a nail bi unit biopsy. Anything other than that, if you're just taking a piece of the nail and sending it to the lab for PCR or something like that, that's fine, but that's not a procedure to collect that piece of the nail. You may have cut the nail and taken a piece of the nail that you sent and have the nail cutting code or debridement code, but that's not a nail unit biopsy. And we spent a lot of time, and after CPT assistant in 2002 published a definitive article that said that what a nail unit biopsy was, and it wasn't clipping a nail or debriding the nail or something like that. Numb up the toe, take a punch or whatever way you want to do it, go through the nail plate and subungual tissue. That's a nail unit, that's a nail biopsy. If you cut their nail and you scrape the junk underneath into a bag, do not use 11755. That's not our opinion. That's in CPT assistant. No matter what any lab person or somebody who stands to make money from you doing it tells you, if you just cut it and scrape some ungal debris in the baggie, don't use 11755. Doctor. Nope. Correct. Question was, if you do what we described, is there a procedure code for that? No. If somebody comes in with a funky toenail and you tell them we're going to send it off for PCR and you cut and scrape it out, it's an E&M if you have performed, documented, and demonstrated medical necessity of the level you coded. Think of it this way. It, there's no E&M code for taking a culture swab of a wound. Analogous. Please. Yeah, that's correct. The question was, can you clip the nails and send that piece of that nail clipping for the, for the pathological analysis? Yes, it's not a biopsy, but you could send it for the, for the analysis. Yeah, I if you're doing that separate procedure on the biopsy itself, like I described, the anesthesia, the punch, all that, and cut the nails at the same time, sure, you can bill for both. You, you bill for both. But if you're just sending a piece of the one of those cut nails for pathology, that's not a biopsy. Right. The doctor said if it's at the proximal aspect and you're worried about a melanoma and you go all the way through nail skin matrix, yes. 11755. Numb them up and document what you did. And we gave you a couple codes to consider. If you uh, do a biopsy by aspiration, if you look at something and you're not 100% sure what it is and you want to suck the juice out of it and send it off to a lab in a bottle, that is biopsy by aspiration. These are the codes for that. Question was asked earlier uh, about if you use imaging, do you get to do that separately? No, because you see the second option there was it included uh, with imaging guidance. So if you do an aspiration with imaging guidance, one code. And we gave you some diagnosis codes to consider for that. Same deal, if you don't want to wait, you can use that D49.2 for I didn't know. And we gave you similar options for uh, bone biopsy. If you do a, a jam sheety, right, little stab incision, trocar cannula bone biter, that's your 20220. If it's open, if you make an incision, reflect and cut out a piece of bone, that's considered open. One note, see it says superficial? There are deep options also. All of the foot bones are considered superficial by CPT. We might think a talus is deep versus a proximal phalangeal head. It's not. If you do it on the foot, it's superficial. The, the way that was decided was that CPT, uh, somebody got up and 
we're trying to figure out the definition between deep and superficial because you can't just name a bone because parts of the femur are deep and parts of the femur are superficial. So you can't just say a bone is deep or superficial. And the bottom line discussion was if you can feel the bone itself, it's superficial. If you can't feel the bone, it's deep. So everything that we do is superficial. Uh, on the bone biopsy, I've got that 85-year-old woman that came from the nursing home. She's got a HD on the fifth, and it looks inflamed. I trim off the HD, and there's the fa head of the phalanx sticking up. Yeah. And it looks crappy. It looks infected. And I clip off a piece of bone, and we send that to pathology for a culture. Is that a bone biopsy, or is that debridement to bone? You guys get that? Okay. So debridement to bone biopsy, or even phalangectomy, right? Ex exostectomy. Yeah, yeah, that's an option as well. Uh, it depends on how you word it, how you document it. For me, I'm doing 11044 because it has a zero-day global. <laughs> debridement to bone. And I'm going to call it a debridement. Every, that whole note is going to say debridement, debride, debride, debride it all the way down to bone including debridement and removal of the head of the proximal phalanx and send it for micro. That's what I would do. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. So, so doctor asked the question, you might have an inpatient that you do an amputation on, you remove the bone, and really it was an amputation, right? Okay. And you can call it, you can call it amputation and hit, get hit with that 90-day global, and then these people lay there forever, right? Now you're going to round on them post-op day one, two, three, four, and 5 for free, or you can call it a debridement and then get your visits for day one, two, three, four, and 5. Let's see if we agree on this. My opinion is the rule of coding is you should choose the code that most closely reflects the procedure that was done. So if it really sounds like it was an AMP, and the documentation and the, the note sounds like an amputation, you should code amputation, even if you, that puts you in the global. You agree? Sort of. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> uh, one of the other options is if you did that amputation and it's open, uh, then I would say in that point I did debridement the bone because sure. I'm, I'm considering closure as part of the amputation. So if I've debrided it down and it's open, then I would be more willing to give you the, as an auditor, to give you the debridement to bone code, and then you're going to come back at some point and close it, or granulate, or wound back, or whatever. But you got a plan on what you're going to do with that open wound. I, I would be more willing to defend an open wound as opposed to a closed wound as to breedment to bone. And then we gave you some diagnosis options to consider for those that you see there. Uh, we've talked about the bunions a little bit already that we've got rid of all the proper names in CPT and they're doing the same thing with other things. Uh, eventually you won't see Whipple procedure in CPT, it'll be the actual description of the procedure. So they're trying to get rid of all of the all of the names. So we've deleted and we redid the bunion codes. We did this in conjunction with American Orthopedic Surgeons Society and American Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society uh, and APMA. So uh, we went through all our coding committees and came up with, with what we thought was a reasonable redo of this whole section. So a couple of things. We've deleted 28290, which was your basically silver bunionectomy. That code no longer exists. This is this is all payers. Yes, this, this isn't is for just everybody. Medicare. This these, is these CPT. CPT changes. So 
when it's in the CPT book, it's for all payers. Uh, we've redone the, the verbiage on 28292, correction, hallux valgus bunion, with or without seismoidectomy. So if you're doing a seismoidectomy, it, you can't bill additional for the seismoid. Even if you're taking both seismoids out, you can't bill additionally for the seismoidectomy uh, if with any of the bunion codes. Uh, so that's been changed. Uh, 28292 it includes a keller if you're doing a keller. It includes resection of the proximal phalanx base. It does not include an implant. That's 28291. 28292 includes resection of the base if you're doing it. Uh, you don't have to do that to use this code. So if you're doing what you would consider a silver, a McBride, Keller, your simple bunionectomies, your non-osteotomy bunionectomies, this is the code to use for it. Jump in any time. We look eager. <laughs> uh, can you go back to that 28292, please? So we lost 28290. It's gone. That was the bumpectomy code, right, if you just remove the medial eminence. People are getting messed up with this. It says removal of the bump, that's the bunionectomy, right? The bunionectomy part is removal of the medial eminence with resection of the base of the proximal phalanx when performed. So people have asked, well, what do I do if I only do the bump if this is a Keller? Well, this is a simple bump or a Keller. It's resection of the base of the proximal phalanx. If you do it, the when performed is very important. And that's why I wanted to point that out. So if you only remove the bump, it's 2A292. If you remove the bump and do a Keller, it is also 2A292. Remove the bump, do a Keller, and take a sesamoid, 28292. Just remove the bump, 28292. Remove the bump, take a sesamoid, and do a ductor tendon transfer, 28292. So it's basically anything you do at the head that, you, that is a bunion deformity, not a hallux limitus, or a hallux rigidus, but a bunion deformity at the head, anything you do there without an osteotomy or an implant is a 28292. So you see the descriptors, and these are right out of the CPT book uh, of 28292, the various options of a 28292. 28293, it's hallux valgus correction with or without seismoidectomy and resection of joint with implant gone. It's deleted. If you are using an old CPT book, there are people in this room that have a 2006 CPT book laying on their table at home. You shouldn't because the Coding Resource Center is out there at a discount today. But if you do, I know you are here. There's people laughing. When you go home on Monday, cross this out. It no longer exists for any payer anywhere. Get it out of your book. 2A294 was also deleted. Cross it out. If you are using an old book, get it out of your book. And the reason this one's deleted because we found that people just weren't doing it. They just were not doing the procedure. Uh, there was a total of like 200 done in, 20, in 2016. Uh, so we're just not doing it, so we got rid of the code. 2A296 is bunionectomy with distal metatarsal osteotomy. Dr. Ward already talked about earlier the difference between an ostectomy and an osteotomy. CPT defines a bunionectomy as a removal of the medial eminence of the first metatarsal head. We may not define it that way, and I'll get to what I mean by that. CPT defines the word bunionectomy as removal of the medial eminence of the first metatarsal head. So when you see bunionectomy, that means removing the bump. If you remove the bump, that is not an osteotomy. Osteotomy is lengthening, shortening, angular correction, shifting. That's an osteotomy. Removing the bump is not an osteotomy. If removing you remove the, the base of the phalanx is not an osteotomy. If you remove the bump and you do an osteotomy, Austin, Revereden, Chevron, those are osteotomies. One code, <coughs> bunionectomy with distal first metatarsal osteotomy. And that's what you see here, the shaded areas. Remove the bump, here they did a Revereden. One code, it's not in this, because this was supposed to be just for distal, but just to be thorough, and we have a minute here. There's a code that was brand new for January 1, 2017. I'm saying this because I saw too many smiles and giggles when I talked about the 2006 CPT book. 
Brand new code, January 1, 2017, 28295. <clears throat> 28295, not on the slides, not in your handout. 28295, bunionectomy with proximal metatarsal osteotomy. So remove the bump and do a crescentic, 28295. Remove the bump and do a closing base wedge osteotomy, 28295. Remove the bump and do an opening base wedge osteotomy, 28295 only. Again, if you're doing the scarf like we talked earlier, pick one. Decide in your mind if it's more distal or more proximal and pick one of the codes. 28298 is bunionectomy. You have to remove the bump with a phalangeal osteotomy. So if you remove the bump and you do an Aiken, one code, 28298. And there's the picture. Remove the bump, Aiken. Doesn't matter if it's a proximal Aiken or a distal Aiken. Remove the bump and do an Aiken. That is one unit of 28298. Then we get to double osteotomy. <clears throat> so bunionectomy, so we have removed the bump and any combination of two osteotomies. So the examples here is here you have remove the bump, distal first met, and phalangeal. So Austin Aiken. One code. We see that done wrong a lot. Austin Aiken people incorrectly do 28296 for the bump in the Austin and then phalangeal osteotomy, 28310. And that's wrong. Double osteotomy, Austin Aiken. Here we have remove the bump, do a base procedure and a head procedure. Oftentimes, if the IM angle is big enough, so big that it requires a closing base wedge osteotomy, when you get done, that proximal articular set angle is elevated. That, all the, almost all the time, right? And you may find that you need a Revierden. So if you do closing base wedge and Revierden, two osteotomies, one code. Here there's a bump with a base procedure and a phalangeal procedure, two osteotomies. Bump, double osteotomy, 2A299. Okay, what about base wedge, Austin, Aiken? <clears throat> so Dr. Ward described three osteotomies, right? You do the closing base wedge, and the pasta's off, so you do a revered in, but the hallux interphalangeal angle's off. Now you need an Aiken, right? So base wedge, revered in, did I say revered in the first one? Base wedge, revered in, Aiken, you've done three osteotomies. What I would suggest, there's actually two options, right? You can do your 28299 for the double to take into account the bump, the base, and the head, and then code phalangeal osteotomy for the Aiken. But what I would do, because it pays more, is 28299 for the bump, the Revierden, and the Aiken, and first metatarsal osteotomy for that base, which is 28306. Three osteotomies you have to account for. Okay. What about when we're, there's a new device on the market now that's a, a, f a plate for fusion of the first metatarsal cuneiform joint, and they say when you use this, it changes the angle so much that basically the bunion goes away and you don't have to only work at the head. So is that a lapidus? So 28297 says... Bunionectomy with first met cuneiform joint fusion. If you fuse the first met cuneiform joint, but you do not remove the bump, we all know that you did a bunionectomy. CPT does not consider that a bunionectomy because you didn't remove the bump. <coughs> Therefore, it would be incorrect to use 28297 if you fuse the first met cuneiform, close down the IM angle, and do not remove the bump. In order to use a bunionectomy code, you need to have removed the bump. So, in the description that Dr. Ward gave, we're so good, we're being uh, 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 CECH compliant, even though this isn't an accredited thing. Um, in the description that Dr. Ward gave, it would be inappropriate to use 28297, because you didn't remove the bump. And that new thing 
which allows you to fuse the first met cuneiform without removing the bump should be first met cuneiform fusion, which is 28740. Similar to that, and that's why we wanted to do this, more and more in the literature, we're seeing procedures that don't involve removing the medial eminence of the first metatarsal head. So for example, a percutaneous minimal incision bunionectomy. So stab incision at the first metatarsal neck, sagittal saw all the way through, push the first met head over, percutaneous fixation. We call that a bunionectomy. They don't have a bump sticking at the side of their foot anymore. The IM angles closed down. We call it a bunionectomy. CPT does not because you didn't remove the medial eminence. So that procedure that I just described would be first metatarsal osteotomy. Just like the lapidus without removing the bump, if you do a closing base wedge without removing the bump, first metatarsal osteotomy. Same idea here. If you do an Aiken without removing the bump, you have not done a bunionectomy according to CPT. Therefore, it would be phalangeal osteotomy only. 28289 with this change, January 1, 2017, underwent a small revision just to specify that it is a colectomy without implant. But not a bunion procedure. This is the dorsal ridge. You may or may not have a bump there that you may or may not take off, but this is removing the dorsal aspect with the diagnosis of hallux limitus or hallux rigidus, not a diagnosis of bunion or hallux abductor valgus. And thanks to Dr. Ward and APMA, thank goodness we finally <coughs> have a much needed, he made this happen for the whole country. We have a much needed first MPJ implant code. This is brand new, January 1, 2017. We never had an appropriate hallux limitus repair with first MPJ implant code ever. It was weird with bunion stuff. We don't have to worry about it now. We have a new code, January 1, 2017. Again, if you're using an old book, you need to write this down. First MPJ implant, 28291. New code. What if the implant only goes on the proximal phalangeal base? It doesn't matter. What it can if? It be a hemi on either side. It can be a total. Uh, it, could be, it doesn't matter. Uh, what, what part of what implant you use. The question is, throw a what if at you. What if, what if the, uh, there's a product that basically is a plug that goes into the first metatarsal head? What, what about that one? Right, so this new procedure, which is really just a plug, like it looks like a square or a rectangle, right? Take off some of the cartilage, stick that plug in there on the first metatarsal head. We actually discussed this at our APMA coding committee meeting last year, and the consensus of the room was that that is a first MPJ implant, and that that should be coded with the new first MPJ implant code, 28291. And just to be thorough, you may end up having to do a fusion in revisions or radical situation. We wanted to throw in the first MPJ fusion code just to be complete. <coughs> we get asked a lot, how do you repair hallux varus? And the answer is it depends. It is never a bunionectomy code. That's a mistake we see a lot. People do reverse Austin and want to call it a bunionectomy. That's not a bunionectomy. If you repair a hallux varus, do not use a bunionectomy code because you haven't removed a bunion. There are several options. We gave you some to choose from here. Uh, there's just the soft tissue work, the first one. The second code there would be if you just need a capsulotomy maybe to release some of that tension pulling the hallux the wrong way. And then we gave you osteotomy of the proximal phalanx. And I think what people do most often with a reverse Austin, uh, that's an osteotomy. That's not a bunionectomy. A reverse Austin is an osteotomy, not a bunionectomy. Therefore, that should be coded with a first metatarsal osteotomy, 28306. Any other questions about anything, any coding stuff?
or anything we covered today or didn't cover today or topics you wished we had covered today? Yes. Doctor. The question was, if you remove uh, hardware, you have the option for deep or superficial. I would go back to doc what Dr. Ward talked about uh, when we talked about biopsies. If you can feel it, I would consider it superficial. If you can't, I would consider it deep. How about this one? We hear this a lot. PIPJ arthrodesis, KY are sticking out the tip. And at week four in your office, you take a hemostat and pull it out. Can you code for that? No. It's part of the global. We see a lot of that. This room is better than most. We hear a lot of that. Or even worse, I like to fixate my Austins with a percutaneous wire so that I can pull it out and code for the removal of the wire. No good. Go ahead. Yeah. We are ingenious, aren't we? <laughs> so the comment, yeah, the comment was a, a buried K wire for a PIPJ fusion uh, that they later go back and take out. And to take it out, they're making an incision at the tip, fishing for the end and pulling it out. Let's just answer that from a coding perspective. My opinion is that if you make an incision and grab the tip of that and pull it out, you should code for the removal. And I would code removal superficial. I wouldn't do it to my mother, but if that's what we're done, that would be the coding advice we, that we I We will leave the medical necessity discussion to yourself yeah. to, to figure that out yourself. Right. I got one, one other one that w I don't think we have touched on. Lesser metatarsal flanger joint implant. There's a code that says lesser meta, uh, metacarpal flanger joint implant. Since we don't have one for lesser metatarsal flanger joint implant, it's the same type work. Why can't I just use that code? No good. <laughs> if you did something that was kind of like taking out a gallbladder, would you use the gallbladder removal code? No. So I do not suggest using uh, lesser metacarpal implant if you put in a lesser MPJ implant. There's no code for lesser MPJ implant. There's not a category three code, is there? There's no code for lesser MPJ implant Therefore, if you do that, you are forced to use that unlisted foot code, 28899. <coughs> and if you do that, I suggest that along with that 28899, you send an op report, a narrative description of what you did, and you pick a existing specific CPT code, which is close in nature to what you actually did and you suggest that they base their payment off of that one. Like for lesser MPJ implant, you might choose 28291, first MPJ implant as the comparable code. That's no fun, the other, but sometimes you're forced to, like a lesser MPJ implant. Why don't we have a code for lesser metatarsal flanger joint implant? I don't know, because we haven't asked for one. Nobody's asked for one, yeah. plus uh, there's not that much literature on it. To go to oh CPT yeah. to get a new code, you've got to have a certain amount of literature, American published, American patients, um, and the literature's just not out there on lesser metatarsal flanger joint implants. So until we have the push from members to want to get the code uh, and the literature to back it up, our hands are tied. We can't go to try to get a code. We'll finish up with one more ad for your practice, one more trick 
one more toy to take home from this. We gave you the idea of biopsy, something you can add to your practice, something that can help you to increase your per visit value. This is another one. A couple years ago, uh, CMS sought to kill the word skin substitutes. Some of these fancy newer products like the amniotic tissues are not skin substitutes, right? A lot of these things aren't keratinocyte based anymore. We're, they're not skin subs, so the new term is cellular and or tissue based products for wounds. Cellular and or tissue based products for wounds, CTPs. That's the new term. And that's referring to using what we still call skin subs in the office. This is a nice addition to your practice. These things are profitable. You get paid for the application and you get a profit on the product. We mentioned earlier with the modifiers talk, buying the product and then putting it on the patient and billing the Q code. You make a profit on that and in some cases, there's a large margin there. It can be a lot of profit. You get paid for the application code, which is only about $100, but you could make a couple hundred dollars on the profit from the product, depending on which one you use and its size and cost. You can shop these. This is a profitable thing. It also is an opportunity for you, maybe, depending on your practice, to keep some of these people. We talk to a lot of podiatrists that as soon as they get a wound that they're uncomfortable with or they think needs advanced care, they ship them off to the wound center. And if you're a wound center person, that's great. I go to a wound center half a day a week. Bring it, send them all, great, I want them there, right? But if you don't, I've heard a lot of people who are frustrated saying, well, I don't have that here. I need to send them to the wound center for that. And then I lose them and they never come back and you've lost that patient. So for some of you, this may be an opportunity to keep them in your office and provide this advanced care and apply skin subs in your office. So we wanted to go through the coding of it. If this is something you want to add or you're doing it now and you wanted to make sure you're doing it properly, if you apply one of these to a leg, your application code is dependent upon the size of the area treated. So if you apply one of these, the first question is how many square centimeters is the ulcer that I'm treating? For leg, if it is less than 100 square centimeters, you start with 15271. That's your application code. Now this gets weird with the numbers. If it's less than 100 square centimeters, you start with 15271, and 15271 is for the first 25 square centimeters treated of the leg. If the ulcer is less than 100 square centimeters total, but greater than 25 square centimeters, now you need an add-on code. Because 15271 only gets you the first 25, and if you go over 25, now you have an add-on code for each additional 25 square centimeters. So if it's less than 100, but over 25, you need an add-on code. So for example, you have a big giant stasis wound and you put a product on there and it's 78 square centimeters. It's less than 100. Therefore, we start with 15271, but that only gets you 25. Now we have our add-on code for each additional 25. So the first 15272 gets you to 50. The second 15272 gets you to 75. We're still not there. The third 15272 <coughs> gets you above the 78, and that's how you would code the application. If we go, if it is leg and it is over 100 square centimeters, you start with 15273 for the first 100 square centimeters. I don't think any of us are gonna be doing this, but if you do that, the 15273 gets you the first 100 and then you need an add-on code for each additional 100, that's a lot, square centimeters and one more time, if it says add-on code, no 
modifier, any add-on code. Ulcer debridement, second ingrown toenail avulsion, 11732, add-on. If it's an add-on code, don't use a 59 or 51 modifier. And then we have the same craziness for foot. If you put a CTP on a foot, how big is it? If it's less than 100 square centimeters, you start with 15275. That gets you the first 25. If you go over 25, there's an add-on code. We can go faster now because we already did this. If it is 100 or bigger, you start with 15277 for the first 100 of foot. We're running out of foot now, right? That's a lot of space on a foot. And there's an add-on code for each 100 that you go over. Now, if you are doing these in your office, it is essential that you read your LCD. If it's a Medicare patient, you need the LCD. If it's a private carrier, they very likely have a policy on CTP or skin subuse, however they word it. You need that policy. And if it's Medicare, you need the LCD. There's a lot of stuff in there, a lot. You cannot just put these things on and say it's a chronic ulcer, it needs a graft. There's all kinds of things that you need to do and hoops that you need to jump through. And this is a national event, so we can't zero in on just the Maryland LCD, because we know there's people from all over the country. Get your LCD if you're doing these. Do not do what the rep told you to do. They might be right, but that scares me. Get your LCD so that you know the right thing to do. If you are using the Coding Resource Center, it will take you four seconds to get your LCD. Medicare, state, it's right there. And it tells you very clearly everything you need. Some of them require an ABI of 0.6. Some of them require that you document that they haven't smoked. Some of them require a hemoglobin A1C of under a certain number. There's a whole list of things that you need to do. Some of them require a KX modifier on both the application and the product. The 1527 <coughs> code and the Q code. KX modifier, did we, we, don't, did we, yeah, we didn't have that. All right, we planned this. We left it out of the modifier talk on purpose because we knew we were gonna hit it here. The KX modifier is the requirements have been met and the documentation requirements have been met. So it is used in situations where you want to tell them, I know there's all kinds of stuff necessary for this code, I did it. It's all there. Some things require that. A lot of DME things require that. Most of the LCDs, it might even be all, I'm not sure, most of the LCDs tell you to put a KX modifier on the application and on the Q code. So you would do 15275KX, Q code number of units used, JCKX, Q code number of units wasted, JWKX. If you use a KX modifier, you're basically swearing that I have all this information that I'm supposed to have, I've got it. And if you want to see it, you're happy to come look at it. I'll, you know, I'll let you look at it if, if you want to see it, you being the insurance company. But you're saying I have it. If you don't have it and use the KX modifier and they audit and say, hey, I want to see all the data that, that you said you had and you don't have it, now you, you got a problem. So make sure you have all the information that's required. Look at the LCD, figure out what they require jump through all those hoops, and then you can put the KX on the claim. We mentioned before, you need to know the Q code. When somebody shows up this week with one of their new amniotics, it will happen this week, right? Because it happens every week. <clears throat> you have to ask, do you have a Q code? Because if they don't, you can't get paid by an insurance carrier, unless the patients are paying cash, which my people aren't doing. We covered this already. You need to code not just document, but now code number of units used and number of units discarded with the appropriate modifier. We kind of gave this example already. I don't think we need to do this. The application may need a KX. We didn't put a KX here. Check your LCD. It may tell you you need a KX. 
This, I, we just picked one of the Q codes. I don't remember which product that is. And go through your LCD. Or even if it's private, many, if not all, of the private carriers have a skin sub policy. Get it, read it, and make sure you have met all the requirements. It's our responsibility to know. If they come after you, you saying, I didn't know that, does not get you out. If you sign the contract, you are responsible to know. Some of them require arterial Doppler. Some of them say it has to be four weeks. Some have to be six weeks. My Novitas venous leg skin sub says it has to have been present for three months and has to have not responded under my care for 30 days. So you got to know what your LCD says. So if you're good at what you do, you can't use the, LC the skin substitutes then? If you get them healed in 30 days, you sh yeah, no good. You shouldn't be doing this. So these are just some things to look at. <clears throat> know your LCD. Just some points to consider. But this is a controversial topic. So we talked about coding for applying them and coding for the product. We also have these prep codes, which your sales people love to tell you to use, because these pay really, really well. Preparation in anticipation of receiving a graft. 15002 for leg and 15004 for foot. The idea here is you are preparing the site to receive the graft. This cannot be done on the day of application, but if you see them three days before or a week before and you are debriding the ulcer in order to re prepare it to receive the graft, this code may be an option. Now, some LCDs, this is very important, this code pays a lot of money. This is 300 something dollars for this. Some LCDs, like Ohio, I know, specifically says, do not use this with the anticipation of a skin sub, that it's really for the week before a split thickness skin graft, a real graft. Some LCDs say, do not use these prep codes if a skin sub is coming next week. Other LCDs specifically say, like Novitas, it I'm in Novitas, that's why I keep referring to it. Those are the ones I know really well. It is okay to use these in anticipation of a skin sub. Novitas says you can, it tells you right in there, you can use this in anticipation of receiving a skin substitute. I struggle with this, I'm anxious to hear your opinion. I struggle with this because most of the time, the debridement that you do a week before the graft or a couple days before the graft it's no different than the debridement that you do when you're coding a 11042 or a 97597. It's the same thing. So why can I do this today just because I have a graft coming next week? And the answer shouldn't be because it pays $320. I struggle with this. How do you feel about it? When we redid the skin substitutes at CPT about eight years ago, uh, this was a question we went back and forth and we decided just to kind of leave it and revisit it the next time we redo the skin substitutes codes, which will probably be in about another four or five years. So it's, it's in limbo. It's what, what, what do you, f how do you look yourself in the mirror? Yeah. Which, which way do you think you can look yourself in the mirror and live with yourself? Um, I'm not going to do debridement and then the next day, although I could, I could debride the wound on Monday. I could theoretically do a, site preparation on Tuesday and then put a graft on on Thursday. Yeah. Nothing says I couldn't do that. I won't do it because I want to look myself in the mirror. Uh, but nothing that says I can't do that. So I, I think the take home here is you have the option for these site prep codes preceding your graft a couple days before. I wouldn't do it more than a week before. Doesn't say that anywhere. That's my suggestion. You can do this preceding your skin sub or CTP application. Check your LCD. Some write out say you can't, some write out say you can. If you do, our suggestion is that you have a comfort level with it 
I would suggest if you're using this, it's different than the regular old debridement that you did. They use the word creation of recipient site by excision. If you just take off the hyperkeratotic margins and scrape it up a little bit the, would, the way you would do a normal debridement, you might not feel comfortable using this. If you say, I'm putting a graft on next week, I really need to go after this this time and really excise the whole thing and make it bleed more and take more time, then you may feel comfortable doing it. That's how I do it. I have some where I know I'm doing a graft next week where I do, and I have some where I don't. And it really depends on what I did at that visit. That's how I make the differentiation. And I agree, the description of the procedure should be different between your debridement and your skin site, your wound preparation. It should read different. I should read it as an auditor and say, uh, yeah, this is not a regular debridement. <coughs> Question. Please. Cool. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we're not saying don't use the code. We're just saying use it in the right circumstances. Right, so doctor is at a wound center, and she said there's a lot of work that goes into limb salvage. I think we should deserve to get paid for that code. So be careful. It's not a situation of deserve, right? If the decision should be more based on if you performed what the code describes. So if you do prepare the site by excising it, I totally agree. I don't agree that you should use it because these people are really difficult to deal with, right? If you've met the description of the code, totally agree, you should use it. What else? We very much appreciate your attendance. We're glad you're here. I think this was fun. I hope it was productive and useful, and have a safe trip home.